Why are we paying for this? Why are we voting these people into office who are engaged or engaging in this stuff? We bear responsibility. And I will repeat again, it's not the Iranian people versus the American people decision. In fact, we are all in the same boat. It's our people in the West, people in the Middle East, the Iranians versus the Clintons of this world versus the Kissingers of this world versus the Obamas of this world. As an Iranian, do you want to become another Syria? That's my question to you. People in Iran, do you want to become another Syria? Take a look at it. Welcome everyone, I'm Spiro with Newsbud, joined with the founder and editor of Newsbud, Sabel Edmonds. Hello everyone, good to be with you. Well, we have been covering uh, Iran here recently with the, in our reports. There's been a lot going on, uh, both behind the scenes and on the world stage. And uh, we want to give some more uh, information, some context, a little bit more analysis about what is at stake here uh, with these recent developments. Sabel? If you're looking at the macro picture here, the Iranians currently are standing on this junction, okay? It, think of it as a crossroad, okay? Crossroads, they are in this position that in some ways they have to make a choice. They have to make a decision. And when it comes to choices, when it comes to decision making, what do we do? I mean, forget about political stuff. What do we do generally in life? Okay. You want to go to a doctor, to a surgeon, because you have some important surgery coming up. One of the first thing you want to do, at least I do. Okay. Is what? Is to find out if this particular office, this particular surgeon has a good track record. Isn't that right? So you want to go and nowadays with the internet, look at the reviews of this particular surgeon. We do that even with our travel to make decision about where we are going to dine. We like to go and look and see what kind of track record this restaurant has, what kind of review it's getting. Well, the Iranians currently have plenty of case examples to look at, and these are not historical case examples from a century ago. We are looking at several, several good examples and cases in less than two decades when it comes to the USA with its liberation, the so-called liberation wars, liberating countries. And at that point, after looking at the recent case examples, it is for the Iranians to stop and say, is this what we want? Okay. Is this what we want? And when we are looking at case examples and, and, and the so-called liberation, I'm talking about not only the horrendous, very costly wars, okay, with hundreds of thousands of deaths with millions of people injured, with millions of people displaced, with houses, infrastructures turning into rubbles, okay? I'm looking at costly, costly war, but not only that, we also need to look at the aftermath, immediate aftermath, long-term aftermath. And this is exactly what the Iranians should be looking at, which I'm sure they are, because they are very smart people. Uh, there are these um, these myths that are being thrown out on Iranians, okay? Number one, Iranians don't like to be jumbled up with what they call um, Arabs. They are saying, well, we are Persian culture. It's a very rich culture. And if you look at the statistics for the Iranians in Iran, you look at the number of people who are graduates from the universities, when you look at the percentage of women in the workforce, okay, in the workforce and in universities, highly educated, you are looking at a very, very sophisticated, educated, informed people, group of people that make up 
Iran's population, majority of them fall into this category. So I don't want to sound like some kind of an arrogant person saying Iranians must be looking this. And not only that, many of our viewers right now, as I'm saying these words, they're going to be saying, oh, is this geared, Sabal's message, what she's talking about? Are these geared towards Iranian audience? And my answer to that question is absolutely not. Because when we are looking at Iran, okay, and what is taking place in preparation by the USA, we are not looking at Iranian people on one side and the Americans, let's say, or the Westerners on the other side. Those are not the sides. Actually, when you're looking at the situation, you're looking at the Iranians and the American people and the Western people all in one side and a few vested interests the ones we refer to as shadow governments, deep state, the military industrial complex, those happen to be on the other side. So on this left-hand side that I showed, that includes we the people, whether we are in Iran, whether we are in the United States, United States, whether we are in the United Kingdom, it's us versus the deep state versus the very few vested interest. So that's what we are talking about. So no, this is not geared towards a particular country with particular population. This is for all of us versus what we are trying to counter here. So when we are looking at these so-called liberation wars and its cost, and the cost also is picked up by who? By we the people here in the United States. You the people in England. We are picking up the cost. It's not only the lives of the soldiers, our military service members, but take a look at tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars we pay. And the so-called gain happens to be, whether it's the oil, whether it's the weapons, happens to be profit for the very few. So when you're looking at gain, that's the only group that gains. Okay, when you're looking at losses, you're looking at all of us, whether we are in Iran or whether we are here in the United States. Outside that cost, so you say, okay, Germany had a war too. They rebuilt, they became a better place. Well, that's why I'm asking everyone to look at all the recent examples of liberation wars, liberation wars targeting the Middle East. And this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about Iraq. That's where we're going to start. We're going to talk about Libya. And we're going to talk about Syria. Well, uh, yes, you mentioned a lot there. That that's There's a lot of information here. And like you said, essentially, uh, we the people... Uh, not only are they doing all of these liberation wars in our names, uh, but we are financing these wars. Uh, and essentially, I mean, you know, we have responsibility to bear for that. We have essentially blood on our hands, so to speak. Now, with Iraq... Literally, literally blood in our hands. You're right. Yeah, and, and now Iraq. Uh, it's been in the headlines a lot lately. It's a very hot situation there. And we're not talking about the 115 degree temperatures, although that may be adding to what's taking place there. Uh, we're seeing some of the worst conditions in Iraq in years, and probably over a decade. And, and we have, we're witnessing massive protests and unrest, and which is mainly being attributed to poor living standards provided by the government and an energy crisis. Now, currently, the government is rationing energy to the public. Uh, while, meanwhile, the government is continuing to supply its own facilities with the, the needed energy sources, while leaving the people, you know, hanging out to dry, basically. And it's interesting that the Iraqi government is partially blaming the public for this energy crisis, calling the, the people wasteful consumers. <clears throat> now, there is a lot of, lot of uh, unrest there. People are taken to the streets. Uh, they are uh, storming the airports, causing it to shut down, storming buildings, government buildings. Uh, uh, they've even stormed foreign oil companies, causing the staff to evacuate and cease their operations. Iraq is the number two producer of oil in the world. Protesters have even set politicians' houses on fire, allegedly. Now, this is the result of liberation here? I mean, what, what is, I thought we were going there to help the Iraqi people. Oh, absolutely. This is exactly what we created in Iraq, because look, 
these recent protests and the, all the deaths, casualties as a result of it, the country has been bogged down in corruption. That's one of the main reasons for these protests. So you have had insecurity, rampant insecurity that has not even gotten anywhere close to being contained in Iraq since 2003. And especially building up since George W. Bush declared our aggression, the aggressive war on Iraq as a major victory and as a mission accomplished. Let's take a pause. Let's take a pa pause and take a look at this brief clip on, on our president here back then, George W. Bush calling Iraq and what we did there with hundreds of thousands of deaths, with hundreds of thousands of refugees, with all the buildings being destroyed, the infrastructure being destroyed, okay, and actually igniting even more sectarian wars a victory. Let's watch this. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. And now our coalition is engaged in securing and reconstructing that country. In this battle, we have fought for the cause of liberty and for the peace of the world. Our nation and our coalition are proud of this accomplishment. Yet it is you, members of the United States military, who achieved it. Your courage, your willingness to face danger for your country and for each other made this day possible. Because of you, our nation is more secure. Because of you, the tyrant has fallen and Iraq is free. Now, since this victory, this victory, this liberation war victory was declared by the United States president, George W. Bush, Iraq has been spiraling downwards, okay? It had, we have been seeing Iraq on the news almost on daily basis, on daily basis in the past 10 years. Whether it is all sorts of terrorism incidents with massive casualties in different factions, regions of Iraq, whether more conflicts between the Shias in the South and the Sunnis, whether on all the corruption involving a, a non-existent government. It doesn't even have any government 13 years after this victory was declared, okay? Economically, infrastructure-wise, Iraq has been going down since this victory was declared. Now, this was our freedom fight. This is how they sold this war to the Americans, to the Western world, all the NATO member nations. Take a look at this. Take a look at these scenes we are seeing here. Take a look at all these headlines, the sources we are going to list at the bottom of our post for this video. And we, you, Americans, Brits, take a look at it and say, is this what we did? Obviously it is. And then tell us what does it have to do with liberation? Because one good way to do things is, and I have been doing this, okay, every year, I go look at the State Department advisory, okay, for travel. Pick the country. There is a menu there. Drop down. Pick Iraq, okay? And then read what the State Department has to say about you and I, all of you in the UK traveling into Iraq. And this advisory has been the same every single year since George W. Bush declared victory on his liberation wars. Okay, let's go ahead and, and read the advisory by the State Department on the sorry state of this nation, Iraq, for the past 12 years. So taking a look here at the State Department travel advisory and, and keep in mind that the Iraqi government has declared a state of emergency right now and they have blacked out the internet throughout most of the country during all this unrest. So according to the State Department travel advisory it says do not travel to Iraq due to terrorism and armed conflict. Keep in mind that this is a liberated country. This is post-liberated Iraq.
It says that U.S. citizens in Iraq are at high risk for violence and kidnapping. Again, post-liberated Iraq. They also mention if you do decide to go to Iraq, make sure that you draft a will before you go. Isn't that incredible, Sabel? Draft your will. Get, get your affairs in order, basically, before you go to Iraq, because chances are you're not coming back. Absolutely, Spiro. And guess what? Before the war, before our aggression wars directed at, at you know, Iraq, we didn't see advisories like that on Iraq. In fact, interestingly, our liberation wars target the most secular regimes, governments in the Middle East, okay? Because look, on one hand, you have Saudi Arabia. Women can't even drive, okay? You see how they are covered in the ninja stuff and everything. You have Kuwait. You have Qatar, right? Those are our allies. And let's say in terms of a scale on need for liberation, rights for women, they rank the highest, right? We never target those countries, not that we should, because it's none of our business. But look at the most secular three countries in the Middle East, okay, that we have targeted with our liberation wars. Iraq, with amazing universities, modernized, secular, none of the Sharia law businesses. Libya, same thing under Gaddafi, and the same thing during the Assad's government, Assad's Syria. Assad Syria has always been known as a secular nation. So not only that we are targeting these nations, we make sure we target that they are uh, secular of all the countries in the Middle East, the most secular nations. Now, speaking of the liberation wars and our NATO, U.S. military uh, fighters as the freedom fighters, I think this would be a good <laughs> good section to just take a pause because it's really troublesome and laugh because I love what George Carlin describes here as what it is to be freedom fighters. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people <laughs> or they depopulate the area. The government doesn't lie and engages in disinformation. The Pentagon actually measures nuclear radiation in something they call sunshine units. <laughs> Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? <laughs> they never mention that part of it to us, do they? <laughs> never mention that part of it. So. That was our liberation case for Iraq, okay? We destroyed a secular country, caused hundreds of thousands of that, orphans, refugees. And in the past 12, 13 years, we have seen a nation that has been destroyed, completely destroyed. There is nothing left of Iraq. Anything they had has been destroyed. No safety. <laughs> Forget about liberty. You can't even breathe and live in Iraq. Next, this becomes Obama's chapter. Let's move to Libya. That's another country we liberated, thanks to Hillary Clinton and Obama. And let's talk about the shape Libya is today. Let's talk about this liberated country, the quick victory for Obama administration concocted, concocted by Hillary Clinton. So, uh, as you stated, moving from one administration to the next, uh, it's pretty much just the same agenda, the same game plan, but just in a different location. As you stated, uh, the Clinton State Department was spearheading this operation into Libya. Uh, it later came out that uh, you know there were massive uh, weapons smuggling operations taking place there in Libya, uh, where the U.S. and Western allies were conducting covert operations. There's you know massive. Uh, well, a lot. It was a strategic place. And, and basically, we see the same thing. We see a prosperous country, which was once a prosperous country, even under uh, the supposed evil dictator Gaddafi. It was a, a prosperous country. 
Well, uh, he, he, made, he said some things and did some things that uh, the West didn't like, uh, such as you know, having their own kind of currency, using their own golds, uh, keeping, protecting them, their own interests with their own weaponry, whether it's declared weapons of mass destruction or not. Keep in mind the U.S. is the only country to ever really use a lot of these weapons of mass destruction, aside from some chemical weapons, which the U.S. usually typically provides to nations. But Obama would later come out and say that this was his worst mistake ever. Uh, no accountability. We had how many U.S. Um, people die, including an ambassador and some security forces and, and SEALs that took place at the, the infamous Benghazi uh, uh, embassy or black site there. But again, uh, the country is in ruins at this point, no longer a prosperous nation. Uh, they, they estimate that in Libya, uh, and of course, these estimations, these numbers, it, it varies on where you go and where you look for this information and this research. Um, and again, they only, a lot of them look at the period of time during the actual conflict. They're not even taking into consideration the uh, numbers and the bodies and, and all of that after the conflict, post-liberation. But they estimate that around 22,000 people were killed in Libya during this conflict. Remember, this was a very short period of time. Millions of people were displaced. It's estimated that two million people fled Libya to Tunisia alone. Now, this, and there's millions of people who are still needed humanitarian aid. And keep this in mind, Libya's population is six million people. So over a third, about a third of their population had to flee the country thanks to our liberation uh, project operation. Absolutely. In fact, when you and I were traveling and looking at the refugee camps, post-Syria refugee camps, the Syrian refugee camps, interestingly, you and I ended up coming across more people from Iraq and from Libya who have escaped via these boats and come to countries like Greece. We ended up talking with them. They were more from Libya and Iraq, then they were even from Syria. Granted, 3.2 million refugees from Syria because of us, the West, has just 3.2 million ended up in Turkey. And I'm so glad that you brought up uh, Obama admitting this as being his worst mistake. Because when you run a search on post-Libya, one of the first results happens to be from our mainstream media here, okay, CNN. And the title reads, seven years after Obama's, in quote, worst mistake, Libya killing is rampant. You know those oil wells? They can't even secure it. Every day there are people who are going and taking over the oil wells. The oil production comes to halt for months at a time. Okay, then you have Haftar that we planted in there trying to take over the government there. You are looking at terrorism. You are looking at uh, downward spiraling economic disasters. You are looking at still refugees trying to get into Italy from Libya. And as you said, one third of a nation. And again, Obama initially called it a very quick, swift and quick operation. We went there, we killed, and we massacred Gaddafi. We liberated Libya. Yes, we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> Please read us the State Department's advisory on Libya seven years later, and this statement advisory, this uh, advisory by the State Department has not changed since Libya got liberated, okay, since Libya got liberated. It's the same. And Libya actually had a pretty decent tourism sector. Before we went and liberated Libya, Libya was a safe tourist destination. I know so many Turkish friends, family members who were visiting Libya during the winter months there in Turkey. Please read us our own State Department's advisory on liberated, post-liberation Libya here. Spiro? Well, Sibel, again, this is disturbing and uh, disgusting. It It uh, is pretty similar to Iraq's uh, advisory. It, in fact, it may be even a little bit worse. Uh, it says, do not travel to Libya due to crime, terrorism, civil unrest, and armed conflict. Well, I, I thought that we went there to stop all that stuff, right? We're the good guys here uh, policing the world. Uh, it goes on to say that crime levels in Libya remain high, including the threat of kidnapping and for ransom. And Westerns, Westerners, including U.S. citizens, have been targeted for these crimes. 
So again, uh, the, the country is in, in ruins, and, and just like these other countries where we have liberated, it's going to take generations to rebuild, to try to, even longer. I mean, the, the, the damage is so significant that I don't think most Westerners, people who have not been, uh, had been to places like this and seen it firsthand or don't really follow this in the news, even if you follow it in the news, it's really hard to put it into perspective just how devastating how devastated these countries are. Absolutely. And now, of course, we are seeing Syria going through the same, same costly, costly wars, liberation wars concocted here in the West targeting Syria. Now, no matter how it ends, whether they kiss and make up with Assad, whether they, they balkanize it, you're, you're going to be looking at for decades to come a war-torn nation that is going to absolutely struggle severely economically in terms of the uh, security, in terms of life-threatening terrorism on daily basis among many, many different factions. And all these factions, I'm not saying they were they were content or anything, but it was, we didn't have this in Syria. Syria had a decent economy, okay? And I'm not saying the Syrian government by any way is democratic. You're looking at a small percentage of Shias with Assad controlling as dictators, right? The nation. But it always comes to choices. Now, if you were, because we did that, okay? We did that in Turkey, we did that in Greece, we did that with all the other Middle Eastern countries and my sources that I have been meeting with. You ask any of these people, whether Libya, whether Iraq, right now Syria, you ask them and say, no matter what is their position, they're standing on political, you know, political situation, whether they are pro-Assad or anti-Assad, which Syria was better for you? What you had eight years ago, seven years ago under Assad, despite the dictatorship and censorship and torturing and making people disappear, a horrible government, okay? And we are not saying Gaddafi was a great angel, great guy. Gaddafi also was a dictator, no more or no less dictator than the Saudi Arabian, okay? No more or no less dictatorial than Pakistan, right? You ask these people, no matter who they support, no matter whether they are Shias or Sunnis, ask them and say, which one was a better place to live for you? Whether you're a doctor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a construction worker, whether you're a police officer. Now, with this, let's take a look at quickly the cost for the Americans. Let's show them in the slides what kind of a tap. You know, they picked up Americans on Iraq war, okay, both before liberation, during the war, and since that so-called liberation of Iraq, with all the money we've been pouring, because we are still in Iraq, it got liberated, but we haven't gotten out, okay, we are not hauling our butts out of that those countries, we are there permanently, we are basically in this stalemate situation, trying to save face and say, yeah, here we are standing in this liberated country, all these soldiers, all these bases, for what? After all, the mission was accomplished. It was liberated. Here are the costs, the numbers for Iraq picked up by the Western nations, whether it's, you know, the Americans, whether it's the Germans, whether it's the UK. But just take a look at the U.S. taxpayers giving these tens of billions of dollars on liberating Iraq. Same thing goes for Libya. Let's present them this number, okay? Let's put some of the numbers here for what we spent on Libya. Let's take a look at how much we've been pouring in weapons and training and all the military and the contractors we are sending into Syria. We have been sending into Syria for the past several years. Now for Iraq, we want you to also, also take a look at these uh, suffrage by our military, by our service members whether it's the burn pits, whether it's paying with their lives, whether those people who have lost their limbs are service members in Iraq. Right. Uh, it, you know, again, Sabelle, 
The numbers vary depending on where you look, and of course you have to keep in mind the time frames because if you're searching for casualties Iraq war, they're only going to look at the period of time from when it began to where it was declared mission accomplished. Not post-liberation, uh, but it's estimated, most places estimate around half a million Iraqis died. Uh, but I've seen the numbers go as high as 1 million, 1 1.2 million, and millions have been displaced right now, just right now, internally, there's about 3 million people displaced in Iraq, and another estimated almost 9 people, 9 million people who are in need of humanitarian assistance. And this is almost a, a, a third or almost a quarter, of their, more than a quarter of their population. They, they have 37 million people. So if you take, you know, these numbers and do the conversion into, you know, what the U.S. population, I mean, it would be millions and millions and mi tens of millions of people displaced. Try to, it's, it's, again, hard to wrap your head around and comprehend, but it's just devastating. See, this is exactly what we were talking about. This is why we started talking about the making choices, okay? The options, the decision-making process that involves not only Iranians in Iran, but also we the people in the West. With this track record, okay? If you are an Iranian in Iran, take a look at these numbers. Look where they are economically, okay? Look where these countries that we liberated, we meddled with, are today economically, are today with their infrastructure, are today with their safety to be able to even get out of their houses and move around. And I am not saying that things are not difficult currently in Iran. I know thanks to the sanctions, the economic warfare waged against Iran and the Iranians, this economic warfare targeting average Iranians, by the way, not really the figureheads. So despite all these economic difficulties you're suffering under, despite the fact that you don't have a government that is fulfilling your uh, needs in terms of democratic needs, your choices, and, and, and it's considered dictatorial, okay? I would be the last person to argue against that notion and say, oh, Iran, Iran's government is not a dictatorial, dictatorship. Because I lived there. In fact, I left Iran. In fact, we became refugees. We had to leave all our belongings, our house, everything, and get out of Iran because of those laws, the implementation of the laws, and the type of government ruling it. Okay? We made a choice. We suffered for it. It was very difficult. But with all that, with all that, okay, with all of these, if you were to weigh and say which one is worse or which one is better, depends on how you look at it, okay? As an Iranian, do you want to become another Syria? That's my question to you. People in Iran, do you want to become another Syria? Take a look at it. Because if you look at the data on Iran, you don't see these death toll, people dying from terrorism. They don't have that. You don't have it in Iran, okay? You have other difficulties, but you are still safe. Economically, you are suffering. I understand. We understand. It's our fault. It's our government's. The vested interest fault is by design. But do you want to become another Libya? Do you want to become another Iraq? Do you want to become another Syria? That's the choice you're looking at. That's the decision that only you, the Iranians, can make. If you allow, if you allow these same people, these liberators, NATO, the United States, if you allow them come in meddle with your, with your affair, with your life in Iran, this is what you're going to end up becoming. You're going to become another Syria, another Libya, another Iraq for the decades to come, okay? If you want to change your government, you can do it internally with your own nationalistic values, with your own way, with your own timing. And that's for you to decide. It won't happen. What you want won't be achieved by the meddling, by the deep state, by the vested interests in the West. You will never get what you want. And as for our fellow Americans, okay, we have responsibility here. Haven't we seen enough? We have been voting these people into office, whether it's George W. Bush and his war with Afghanistan and Iraq, 
whether it's that despicable Obama and that bitch Clinton, the criminal, criminal bitch Clinton and what she's about and what she has what she has caused in Syria and in Libya. OK. Why can't we take a stand and say enough is enough? Take a look at the opportunity cost of those billions of dollars a month you're spending. We are spending with our tax money going into destroying nations, making the world a much less safe place with the terrorism on increase. OK, why are we paying for this? Why are we voting these people into office who are engaged or engaging in this stuff? We bear responsibility. And I will repeat again, it's not the Iranian people versus the American people decision. In fact, we are all in the same boat. It's our people in the West, people in the Middle East, the Iranians versus the Clintons of this world, versus the Kissingers of this world, versus the Obamas of this world, okay? Look at those tens of billions of dollars in profit for Northrop Grumman, okay, SAIC, Boeing. Do you, American, see yourself as someone who is engaged in sharing on these profits? No, you are paying these taxes and they are pocketing it. SAIC, Northrop, Boeing, what do you have in common as far as interest goes with those handful of oil companies and military industrial complex. What do you have in common? Do you know what you have? Zero. It's a negatively correlated interest, okay? It is. So yes, we are together in this. Whether you are in Iran, whether you're in Syria, whether you're in UK, whether you're in Frankfurt, Germany, we are all paying the prices. So take a stand and pause, make the right choice. There are no perfect choices. There are no perfect choices in life. That's not only about politics. That's in general. That's a fact of life. But if you were to choose between the two, what would you choose? Well, that wraps up this uh, episode here, uh, this update with Sabelle Edmonds, the founder and editor of NewsBud, and myself, Spiro Skouris. Uh, we'd like to again thank the NewsBud community for your continued support. Uh, none of this is possible without your support. Uh, stay tuned as we are going to be providing more updates, more analysis, and more news as it happens. For NewsBud.com, I'm Spiro.